when you make something that's you know that kind of moves people and stuff it's it's still a magical thing and it's just i think that's the reason we've got to get into it to begin with and i think keep that and there, there, there's a little bit of magic there and a little you know you feel the hairs on the back of your neck stand up when you hit something yeah. um that's the reason we do it and you know it's not all about money and not all about kind of you know the struggle that's when it makes it all worthwhile yeah so yeah, I mean, that is that is what you said there. That's the big payoff, isn't it? It's when you've done something and you go, oh, fuck me. Yeah. It's that yeah. sheer excitement. And it's also, which then, you know, because what we do is an art form. You know, yeah. where we are creating, and this, this is something Yolanda Charles, the, the bass player, was talking to me about, is that her joy she gets when she's performing, even other people's songs, yeah. them in losing, losing themselves in the moment. And it's just like... The, the, we're, what we're creating is an art form that brings pleasure to people. Exactly, and and that's the thing you shouldn't. That's the thing that you should never forget. I think mm. is you know, people. You get messages from people saying that you know your album helped me through a really difficult time, just recovering from cancer, or what you know we we came down the aisle to one of your songs, and it's yeah. just that. It's just you can't buy that. Can no. you? I mean, that's magic. That. Yeah. Um, some people know who you are, some of the views won't. So this is Adam H. Gibbons, also known as Lack of Afro. Annoyingly, multi-instrumentalist, good at all of them, not too bad at the bass, awesome producer, <laughs> writer, mixer, businessman. Basically, what I would say you are, without being millennial like that, I think you are the definition of the modern music maker in the fact that you... Well, yeah, that you take control yeah. of the entire beast of the music itself. And obviously, you know, you collaborate, and we're going to get to talk about some of the people you've worked with. Yeah. But basically, it's your baby from start to finish. You know, you've been signed to labels, you've got your own label, you've got your own thing that you do. But within that itself, that comes with it, all the sort of struggles and everything is a battle. Yes. Yeah, yeah it is. Yeah, of course. Yeah, so it, it, it's, I think it's one of those, for me, it was like a natural progression. I think, obviously, like you said, I was signed to labels and, you know, you, ge you generally kind of get a good insight as to how the music business works mm. when you're signed to various labels. And I think it's only after you've done it for a certain amount of time and obviously got a feel for dealing with different people. And, and I did, I've dealt with quite a few labels because, you know, I've done quite a few remixes. I was signed to one label, Freestyle, for a long time for my solo stuff, for my artist stuff, and then dealt with a lot of uh, labels from for remixes and stuff and you just get in a, in a kind of you know working to, to see how it all goes how it all works but then i think after a while especially i think this, it's a different time now when when mm. i first started you needed a label and you needed yeah. that um kind of validation from an external label and also like you know to manufacture stuff i wouldn't have had a clue on to how good i had to manufacture how do you manufacture vinyl like back in the day when i first started I, you know i was just excited to put out a record yeah yeah exactly uh, you know, and now Especially with you know with the advent of streaming and Spotify and how easy it is to get your music onto Spotify um, and to kind of you know to you know how sort of yeah how easy it is for people to hear you. Um, you don't necessarily need and I say necessarily need because there are some places instances where labels would be very kind of advantageous to have behind you obviously still. But yeah, I mean it's leveled the playing field a little bit. It's kind of given artists a um, yeah given a, given them a little bit of control back and you know made it a little bit easier to get your music out there, whereas before it was you needed a label and that yeah. was it, sort yeah. of thing. Yeah, totally. But yeah. I mean, with that then, obviously, that ease of like, you know, being able to let people know, but of course, then you've got a whole barrage of other people now, some less talented than others, who are just bombarding a, a finite, I mean, okay, we've got the entire world, but the entire world doesn't listen to music, you know, but we'd say like half the world consumes music, but now instead of having a certain amount of releases worldwide every day, now you've got a thousand times more. Yeah, yeah, um, it's yeah. By democratizing the process, it's just it's made it you know, this, yeah, like you said, flooded the market with with stuff, and that that's the other battle. Yeah, it's made it put stuff out there, but you're swimming with so much other stuff, and trying then to get your music heard, whereas before. You would just send, you know, you would send vinyl promos and even digi promos, like the first yeah. advent of digital stuff. Now 
it's all about kind of you know what content you have and what how can you make your stuff stand out and and you know trying to utilize your, your your time a bit more i think basically now the music even though obviously the music is always the most important thing without mm. it you've got nothing yeah, the yeah. music almost not not enough mm. to you know you need the whole thing whereas before the music would be enough now these days it probably isn't enough and you have to have everything that goes with that um if you're going to give it the best possible chance of success yeah so. yeah no absolutely so with all that in mind let's take you back to the beginning why on earth why on earth did you think, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to make my entire life built around music and try and make a living out of it. Because, <laughs> I'm, you know, a lot of people watching this stuff, they are music fans. And there's quite a lot of people who are producers, engineers, artists, management, or what have you. So they get what, our side of it. But a lot of music fans just don't get why. Because it would seem like the most ludicrous thing to try and do. Um, yeah, I think that's a very good question. I think... It's almost impossible one to answer, really. But I think mm. why we got into it, I mean, why did we get into it originally? It's because mm. we love it. Yeah. And, I th you know, you get into music, you have to get into music because you love it to start with. Otherwise, if you get into it to try and make money, then you've got no chance. I yeah. think it has to come from within. The fire has to be there to make music because you love it. Um, and then I think, I mean, pretty much everyone gets into it by, not by accident, that's the wrong word, but I think there's a point in everyone's, you know sort of career where it almost sneaks up on you really yeah. and if i guess if you have a few when you start making music you kind of chuck yourself into it because you love it and you spend a lot of time you do your ten thousand hours and then before you know it if you know if, if the wind is blowing in your direction and you get a bit of luck and whatever it's you know it becomes almost a viable option almost a viable option it's never like it's never <laughs> never yeah, yeah, no, totally. option never like yes that's a certainty i'm going to do that and make make good money and then you, it's enough it, it gives you enough little snippets enough little kind of tidbits for mm. you to follow it up and think actually maybe this is maybe i could do it yeah um, i think yeah you have to you have to almost be into it for the right reasons to start with i think i think that's where a lot of people fall down yeah to, they don't realize quite how much of a slog um it can be they they kind of see you know I'm not saying they see X Factor and see all these, mm. but they, you know, the music can be glamour, you know, glamorized quite a lot as instant success. But actually, to get proper success and, you know, a what is success anyway, yeah. and b, just to make a living is 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 amazing, really, from it, and sort of count the blessings for that. But it's it is hard, and it's especially in the early days, and it's a momentum thing. The more you yeah. put in, and the more you get out. Um, but then, it, yeah, it's almost a case of. If you were to see what you had to go through in order to get to this stage, would you do it? By almost certainly, you'd say no. Yeah. But you, by now, you haven't got a choice. You've done it, so exactly. you might as well, might as well roll with it, right? Yeah. <laughs> You've made this giant rod of passion and enthusiasm for your own back, haven't you, without even realising it, and then you're like... Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that whole thing, you know, as you said, X Factor, that glamorisation of it and um, superstars, I mean, that goes back to Elvis and, on, you know... and. Absolutely. Because it's that thing people would see that and not realise the sheer gamble and, as you said, 10,000 hours that Elvis put in before anyone had heard anything about him. Exactly. People tend to kind of see, obviously, and social media, man, now is terrible for that because you just see all the, you know, the, the cream and the, the success and the, the what comes with that. You, what you don't see is all the blood and guts and sweat mm. that are behind the scenes. And I think that is true with a lot of careers, but especially music, because... I think musicians, by their very nature, tend to, um, because there's so much shit we have mm. to go through, I think that when stuff does come, yeah. um, when you get a little bit of success, you tend to shout about it. Because, A, because now you have to, yes, because yeah. of social media. B, because, you know, why not? You know, you've yeah. been through enough shit. It's like, yeah, okay, that's, you know, that's a bit of, bit of good news. Why not, you know, why not tell a few people about it? Um, so, yeah, I think that's, that's kind of it, really. Yeah, I mean, what you said about that, you know, people just think, oh, it just sort of happens and they don't understand the sort of that journey before it. I was talking to uh, one of the Libertines and that interview's coming out t tomorrow. And he said they spent six months rehearsing. And people would think Libertines, they're just a, a mess. You yeah. Know? But they were deliberately sounded like that. So they rehearsed that mess. That right. was their framework. It wasn't just, oh, we're drunk and it's just a fucking mess. It yeah. was like, we've written these songs. How do we make them have their own style and spirit, which is different from everyone else. So they rehearse that for six months every day. And then it was like, right... Get, that's even harder to get perfect, isn't well, it? That's yeah. harder, you know, harder to kind of... <laughs> to get tight, to get, to get deliberately messy, it's harder to get deliberately yeah. tight. 
that's that's hard work, man. Yeah. That is. But yeah, but then, like you said, you never know. And I think that's the thing. People don't... I think, you know, you do get it with other careers, obviously. Mm. Um, people just, you know, just assume that. But I think with... I don't know what it is about about musicians and stuff, I think, and, and music as a career. I think mm. people just... just I think maybe because there's a lot of magic and that still exists and a lot of kind of, you know, people just see the glamour in music because yeah. it's kind of, you know, always been sort of promoted that way. Um, whereas, you know, you don't see the glamour in accounting, for example, <laughs> although accounting still takes a long time to train for, you know. And, but <laughs> So it's kind of... It would just, you know, they just kind of assume that it happens, whereas, mm. oh, he's just, you know, he's a piano player and, you know... He, he makes a living from it. Oh yeah, cool. And that's you know, it's great. It's mm. piano player, basically. But then the backstory is that you spent you know ten years of your life, fifteen years of your life, absolutely hammering it, and, yeah. and you know, to get to where you where you're going to get to. So yeah, it's a funny one with musicians, that's for sure. Yeah, I mean, I first the first thing I heard of yours, which obviously you know as well, it was like uh, I came across you on MySpace, and it, and <laughs> yeah. it was, and it was yeah. a cu couple of tracks off the first album, Press On. Which you know, it's in my it's it's in my best albums. Like you know, I don't know how many would be in that, but say like my top fifty best albums, it's definitely in there. Because oh, the sound of it was so awesome, and there's many different things, and it was very much right up my street on that the hip hop breakbeat funk nasty dirty sound. But that was yeah, the yeah. first record you made, so. It would be interesting because we're going to put links up to all the, the music we're talking about. So what went into making that record? Because that's the first record you made. And yeah, you made it, it was. On your own. And I think, yeah, yeah, funny enough, I was speaking to my wife about this a few days ago because I, I'd actually listened to Press On last month for the first time in years. Mm. I listened to it start to finish because, it, it, you know, I'm very lucky, man, in the fact that, you know, I made that record when I was 26. Mm. And like you said, first record I made didn't really think much about it and people are still playing it now and, and you know it still gets streamed a lot now and all that sort of stuff and it's kind of it's kind of mental so I thought I'd you know listen through to it and see what see what you think of it now with these ears and mm. it definitely got a vibe about it but I think that's that's the thing I didn't know any better that's yeah. the and as a producer I think sometimes knowledge can be a, a dangerous thing the more kind of options you have the more the more your knowledge base grows about how to do stuff the more options you have the more choices you have mm. sometimes choices is, is a bad thing because it kind of, you know, you get caught in, in a few minds as to how to do things. And sometimes you can end up not kind of nailing any of them. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Kind of that sort of middle ground. And like you said, that record is a vibe. And whether you like it or not, it is something. You yeah. know, it's, it's a vibe. So it kind of, I think it was definitely, it was born out of, of, of a few years of kind of like listening nonstop to sort of funk and soul records mm -hmm. and hip hop, like instrumental hip hop, like Shadow and RJ, RJD2 and AIM and those guys. And it was, yeah, man, it, and it was, a, like I said, at the time, I was, I was 26, I was just grateful to put an album out, and I think it was, you know, I'd heard it, I guess it was me trying to sound like other people a mm. bit, be, I, that's all I had, I didn't have my own identity at all, because it was the first one, so I was doing my best impersonation of Shadow, of, you know, of a few guys, of Quantic, of a few guys, you know, back then, and kind of, you know, fortunately, it sort of came out, came out all right, but again, I had nothing to base that on, mm. and I was writing it on Massive Pro on a massive Dell laptop that barely powered up, you know, plugins that were cracked all over the place, you know, stuff <laughs> crashing all the time. I remember actually it was a, this Dell laptop. I just got, I found it the other day and I had to, you know, it was like this 17 inch thing. It weighed about 10 kilos, this thing. And I used to take it on the train and like crank it up and like put, and work next to someone. And it's like this wide. And I, used to, I was working in London for First Sky. I used to work, I used to work on the train, I used to mix on the train with these crap ass headphones, go into, um, go into Sky every day and then back. And it just, you know, you, you learn, you because you don't know any better, you just you deal with it, don't you? It's, it's yeah. you know, you make what you can from what you have. And like I said, I think the more you have sometimes is, is a dangerous thing. And that record was, was more made because of the stuff I didn't have. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah but absolutely, it's that thing. And it's really interesting that you'd say that. And everyone I've spoken to, and I know it myself as well, from, you know, starting to make music, and you weren't really basing it on anything apart from your influences... Is yeah. trying to make music that you not copying them, but all your draw all your influences in. Try and make something that is, gets towards the stuff that you like. Absolutely. And yeah. by doing that, it's thing that by doing that on all these hodgepodge of influences, without even knowing it, because you're never going to copy them. It's always going to be different. And but all those different influences from different sources then ends up creating the start of your own sound. Exactly. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, yeah, that's it. So it kind of, I'd had, before I'd, I'd done that album, I'd worked um, for uh, an ad agency mm-hmm. in Exeter. But um, just like, it's just part time. And I, I got asked to rip off a few tracks for some ad briefs. And it was the standards, uh, stuff at the time. So there was like Zero Seven, there was Air, yeah. and Moby, I think there was another one. Um, that stuff was everywhere then. Um, and because they couldn't like, afford to put the um, to pay the to pay the license, the master license for the um, for the tracks, they asked me to rip them off instead. Um, and that that I think went into it a lot because that taught me how to break down a track mm-hmm. and to the, like the you know the, the separate elements of it. And it kind of just trained my ears a little bit. And although I didn't do it for very long, I only did it for like six months, maybe nine months. Um, I think it maybe gave my ears just a the, just a little push that they needed in order mm-hmm. to then stop what it was that I wanted to do and also kind of, you know, made them a bit more receptive to various, you know, parts of songs and what went into songs to make them sound the way they did. Yeah. Um, by that, you know, from that, I was then able to sort of, you know, think, well, you know, this shadow track sounds like this and it's amazing, but what if I did this and what if I made this? And I kind of, I do remember that, that album trying to chuck, I chuck stuff together and then it was more of a case of whittling stuff down mm-hmm. to kind of, you know, keep the, the essence of the track there without, you know, over cluttering stuff. Um, and I think, yeah, that like you said, the more I was trying to sound like other people, but then clearly you're never going to sound like mm-hmm. guys like that because you're not them. Yeah. You hear it through your ears, and then by that, it then creates your own your own thing. So, yeah, I think that was definitely the the thing with that one. Yeah. For sure. And, and also, what you think, what you got to think of, all your influences were doing the same thing as you. Yeah. <laughs> they, they, exactly. It's that whole journey, and it's almost like we'll we'll go back in time to the to the, the start of you know music. It's the same yeah. thing, isn't it? Everyone's in that position because they've got different influences and then you, they become your influence, which, you know, without, get, without getting too mystical about it, it's what Tom Grennan called this never-ending st- song this, this, yeah. this, that just flows through the heavens and we all get in at some point and yeah. do our own yeah. version of it. But, True. you know, you mentioned um, working at Sky, so would, that was like a, a sound engineering gig you were doing, wasn't it? I was, I was basically training there to be a, a dubbing mixer. Right. So basically, so yeah, a, a dubbing mixer kind of mixes all the audio for um, like documentaries and does a lot of kind of um, records a lot of voiceover stuff and kind of basically just flies in a lot of effects for promos and all that sort of stuff. All the all the promos you hear on Sky Sports, mm-hmm. all like the wishes and the you know coming up next week and all that sort of stuff. All the kind of <laughs> that sort of stuff they mm-hmm. kind of mixes down for that. So I was training to be one of those, but. Um, Sky at the time was um, it was a lovely place to work, but it was very cushy and comfortable. And a lot of those guys there were sort of like late forties, early fifties. Mm-hmm. They were kind of there, they were happy. They were kind of there for the pension, and they had families and all that sort of stuff, and mortgages and everything. And at the time, I didn't. Um, and the music just started kind of, you know, started to you know do something and started to take some momentum. I was doing loads of remixes at the time, which were kind of the bread and butter because it takes you know sixteen years to see any money from anything. So. Um, yeah, so the remixes were the, were the thing that I was doing, and that kind of propelled me to, to kind of, you know, try it and give it a go. Because the Sky, the thing with Sky was that it was kind of dead man's shoes. You didn't get yeah. promoted into So I thought I could be here for another five years doing this. And, you know, it was just a case of jump now or get comfortable, and I jumped. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, brilliant, yeah. yeah. I've been uncomfortable ever since. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember, I remember you emailing me about that actually and saying, do you think I should do it? And I was like, do it! Really? Do, yeah. Is that right? Yeah. Jeez. There you go. So, I apologise. <laughs> but I don't really. <laughs> oh, I knew it was someone. Uh, all these years later, it comes out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, um, so, what is the deal with you being able to play so many instruments? Because I spoke <laughs> to a load of producers who can like play a bit of piano or maybe a bit of guitar, but you're a badass drummer, really good guitarist, okay bass player <laughs> but you can play with the saxophone as well so where does all that come from um it's kind of it just just try i guess trial and error to start mm-hmm. with i mean i kind of i started learning piano was my first instrument my gran um started teaching me piano when i was seven she was you know sort of a um like a concert pianist in the war and all that sort right. of stuff she was a badass piano player um my family's always been musical my, my dad played a bit of drums a bit of guitar my uncle plays drums um, and some guitar and stuff, and it was kind of around. Um, but I just, I think the first sort of instrument I got sort of fairly competent on was saxophone. I picked that up when I was about 12, had lessons, got mm. to like grade or grade thing. Right. And I don't know, <clears throat> it was after I left school. Um, and actually, at, at sort of secondary school, I started kind of, you know, doing that thing where this was the Britpop days, mm. as you, you'd be well aware. 
um, started listening to like rubbish, like ocean color scene and weather and stuff, <laughs> like, awful stuff. Um, and then, you know what it's like, you kind of start, there's, there's music you listen to a lot, if you're kind of musically minded, which by then I was, I guess, because of the whole saxophone and piano thing, you start sort of just picking stuff up. I and mean, there's guitars everywhere at school, everyone's got guitars around and all that sort of stuff. So I just, just kind of started picking stuff up. Um, and I guess my ear wasn't too bad by then because of the whole saxophone stuff and mm. piano stuff. But picks chords up. A friend of mine, everyone has a mate at school that shows them a few chords and away you go sort of thing. And so, yeah, just started playing along. And I think then at university, I started getting into the bass more because then the whole funk and soul thing kicked in wow. when I was at uni. And then obviously, you know, the bass is everything with that, mm. with that music. Not the Britpop stuff. That's just, you know, root notes. And it? it's Could just be anything. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, when you get to, when you get to uni... When I got to uni, that was when the bass kind of started coming in. Mm-hmm. And that's, that, the drums I picked up a few years back. My uncle showed me a few things. My dad showed me a few things. And I guess it's just a case of what I was, I was inquisitive. I was always mm-hmm. inquisitive about, you know, different instruments and how they worked and how it kind of all came together with various, you know, the, the players that played them. And I always kind of had a, had a sort of vision of... I, mean, I remember when I was at uni, I started to listen to tracks uh, as like a whole mm-hmm. instead of just the individual elements. Um, whereas before I kind of like, oh, the drums on that are amazing. They're good, you know, I then when I was at uni and started kind of writing my own stuff, I just kind of started listening to whole to tracks, you know, as a, you know, sort of um, made up of their constituent parts, mm-hmm. I guess. And I think that even spurred me on even more to start, you know, more stuff, more you know, pick up more instruments and just just have a go. Really, it was yeah. just. I think, and also like you know, writing your own tracks and that kind of stuff. It's if you can put stuff in. If you can put stuff down, um, and you know you don't have to get a musician in or whatever, and it's and you can cover it, and yeah. if the song kind of you know is is fine with just a normal part, then then why would you, you know why not yeah. sort of thing? I think the the sort of advent of the albums where all the guys were doing it themselves. I remember listening to the um, to play by Moby, and also obviously the Shadow stuff, and sampling obviously woke, you know woke me up to the fact that you could do all this stuff, mm. and it sounded like and and. But you didn't. But you didn't need anyone else. So it kind of I knew enough on instruments to cover the stuff that I needed to cover. Yeah. So I never kind of lost that sort of interest in instruments and interest, you know, in playing. Um, but yeah, so it's just. I mean, I guess necessity is the mother of invention, I suppose. So I guess yeah, I just it was necessary for me to be able to cover those that stuff. And I didn't really know anyone in London when I was writing the, the press on. So it's like you know. I have to get this stuff. I have to be able to play this stuff in. Otherwise, yeah. it doesn't get played in. I have to find a sample or something. So, probably much easier if I just play it in. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Exactly. And then, sort of moving through the albums, because obviously, um, you've done seven as lack of Afro now, haven't you? Yeah, seven. Which, which is, <laughs> yeah, I know it's amazing, isn't it? Really. But as as no, they man. as they progress, you've gradually brought in more vocalists. Yeah. See, which, that's that's the thing. I, and, Weirdly, when I first when I did press on and, and and my groove, you'll move the first two. Even though my groove did have vocals on it for the first time, I never sort of envisaged doing vocals. Mm. Weirdly, because I think I was so obsessed with the whole instrumental hip hop thing and the cut and paste funk stuff, you know, and, um, of, of press on and stuff. That I I just didn't see myself as that guy. Mm. But then I've always had a bit of a soft spot for pop music as well, and obviously, you know, and the song as a, yes. as an art form. So then you. Once you start wanting to incorporate vocals, then you're kind of, you know, talking about verses and middle eights and, and you know, pre-choruses and all that sort of stuff. And then, obviously, there's no end to it then once you're in that. So I think that was just a natural kind of progression of, of me getting the, the instrumental stuff out on the first album and then thinking, right, you know, hearing stuff around, oh, that's a great song, maybe try and write something like that. And then it all kind of went from there, really, I yeah. suppose. And then that then brings in, because this is what I, I think is really interesting, and part of one of the main things we're talking about in this series is a lot of people think music is just made by one person on their own. You know, a lot of the uh, sort of the headphone generation or the, ear, the, you know, the earbud generation, you know, yeah. it's like someone with a laptop and that's all it is. And you kind of started like that. But as I said, then you start to collaborate with more people. So then that brings yeah. in a whole other influence on the music you're making because you're having yeah. to either write for other people or adapt what your track is to the way their vocals are. Yeah, exactly. But I think the whole... When I did incorporate vocals, I was never... Um, I never kind of sat down at a piano and mm. wrote a song. Mm. It wasn't like I automatically... Be- you know, started becoming like that. It was I still came from it, came at it from an instrumental background. So I put together an instrumental, and then I would send it to a vocalist to to do their thing. It was only on 
I think a few albums in where I sat down with a vocalist in a room, mm -hmm. you know, whether, um, <clears throat> whether I was on bass or guitar and started to collaborate with them um, in, in a live situation and, and you know, bounce stuff off in, you know, straight away. Um, and I still, to a, to a certain degree, I still like working on my own and then, you know, sending back and forth. It kind of gives you a little bit of a freedom in terms of not wanting to offend. And it, it, although it's slower and it's yes. bloody it's so, you know, boring and, and tiresome at times, it does give you a little kind of, yeah, the freedom to actually put something down and think, actually, that's pretty good and then send it away. Whereas if you're in a room with someone, as you know, it's kind of sometimes you're, you're, yeah, you're scared. You're not, where well, you're sort of like a bit afraid to sort of, you know, say, yeah, I'm not feeling that. Yeah. You kind of run with stuff for as long as it takes for the other person to think that it's rubbish. And then you think, oh, sure, thank Christ, yeah, I didn't like the other <laughs> Let's move on. <laughs> that is so, so, it's so true. It's so true. <laughs> you guys, that politeness, that polite kind of 15 minutes where you both think this isn't working, but neither one of you's got the balls to say, nah, let's just move on. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, yeah, but I, the vocal one, yeah, I think but the vocals just came from a fact where a lot of people were saying, oh, you should get a vocalist on your stuff. Mm. It's quite linked itself to, to vocals. And me listening to other vocal tracks and me listening to a lot of, actually a lot of pop, I remember, from, but before one of the records. Um, and thinking, yeah, I'll give it, I'll give it a crack because you know, I guess there's only so much, so much instrumental stuff you can put down before you need vocals are the focus, aren't they? And they're the, you know, they're everything really in terms yeah. of the, the actual song itself. If you're looking at it from that point of view, um, so yeah, I think it was just a case of you know just wanting to try something, try something different, really. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely, and it's like you know, I mean, there are musical forms where, you know, jazz, obviously, generally, yeah. you know, obviously you have jazz singers, but you know. Miles Davis, you don't go, oh, wh where's the fucking vocal? <laughs> yeah, right. But when it comes to what we class as pop music, yeah. the general punter, it's all about the vocal. Yeah. Always. Yeah, no, really, no. you can't. And that was the other thing as well, I think. After Press On, there was a point at which I, you know, I DJ quite a lot. Mm -hmm. after, um, and you kind of meet different people and stuff, and then you sort of tell them, even not the people that are coming to the DJ sets necessarily, when you told them that you were a musician or producer, they're like, oh, yeah, just send me some stuff, and you do. And like you said, the vast majority of people just don't get it. They don't get the fact that it's instrumental. And it's like, and yeah, there's a, there a part of me, I guess, that thought I wouldn't be taken seriously as a musician if I didn't start incorporating mm -hmm. vocals into tracks and writing songs. And to a certain extent, man, that's still, that's still true, really. Yeah. You know, still trying to, <laughs> trying to write better and better songs but like you like you, you know it's it's you're looking for them to you know looking for something that probably doesn't exist you know and that's what spurs you on i guess yeah um what, what you can manage in the meantime whilst you're trying to get there this this kind of comes out but yeah i think you know the vocal thing was definitely a not wanting to repeat myself either and just you know evolving well i've, I've noticed that across all, all your records it's like still got the genesis or that the the the, the, the core the, of what was press on, but then it's kind of moves more. And that's what I was talking about, bringing in different vocalists, but your sound has evolved as well. It has, yeah. And that, I think that's, that's come more from, um, from sort of, you know, more knowledge that I've gained as a producer about how to, to incorporate different sort of, you know, techniques, engineering techniques, different kind of listening to more music, um, not wanting to repeat myself either, kind of using, you know, using session musicians as well and just, you know, trying to... Yeah, just trying, just trying to do stuff, something different. I think it's kind of, it is, for me, it's important as an artist that you have to do, keep evolving and stuff. Because I just, you know, I think it's, you have to want to, well, especially when you get into album seven, like, because, you know, if you, <laughs> if you need to say something different, because you can't keep, seeing, you know, what have you not said? So you have to make it, you know, by album seven, you have to make it kind of, you know, keep striving. And that, as well as kind of producing, you know, something different, it keeps it interesting for yourself. Yeah. I think you interested you can't just go through the motions because again that you're in it if you're in it for that you're in it for the wrong reasons and it's going to come across in the music oh uh, yeah totally even though people don't see the you know the, the behind the scenes of you kind of pulling your hair out <laughs> every single album and you know wanting it just to just to all fuck off it's you know at the same point it's you have to you have to challenge yourself i think and that's yeah. that I think, important yeah i mean that's why i think it's if you think of most artists and not necessarily producers who produce loads of other artists, but I'm just talking about you as an artist. To have done seven albums, most people never, bands and, and solo, solo artists, never get that far. No, it would be no. two, three, four. Yeah. And then it's like, yeah. so to actually have progressed and still that search for something new. <laughs> yeah. Is, you know, as a, that, we all do it and it yeah. drives you mad. But that's why one of the, it's like the love hate thing we have with it. 
It's like, you know, we always reach for the things that bore us immediately when we play yeah. an instrument or start to put a track together. You're like, oh, I've done that before. Yeah, yeah, what yeah, can yeah. I do that's going to excite me? And if it excites me and then you get to the end of the track, you know, if you're still working on it, you go, OK, this is something new. But yeah. there's so many yes. things that fall away to even get to that track, which no one even really outside of music even sees, do they? No, exactly. I think that's it. You have to, when, you, when you're this far in, you have to make music for yourself. Yeah. I think as soon as you start trying to make music for other people, I think that's when it'll probably fall down. You have to, you have to ask yourself, am I going to, would I buy this? Yeah. You know, do, do I love this enough to, to kind of, so that, do, you, do I love this enough? If I love this enough, yes. If I do, then that means other people will love it too. I think, and that's so important. And for me to love something, I have to be a little bit challenged by it as well. It yeah. has to be something, and I can't. I mean, there were so many people, man, that have asked me to do. You know, when are you going to do like, another album? I press on. Mm -hmm. But you know, never. I'm yeah. not. I, I kind of have done it. Do you yeah. know what I mean? And I couldn't make it anyway. If mm. I tried to make that album again, I couldn't do it. Yeah, yeah, uh, of course. It'd be, it'd be, it'd be cleaner. It'd be more. You know, and maybe it would sound a bit fuller, but there would, it'd be a different vibe. Mm. You know, um, and it kind of, I, you know, I think. Lots of artists can keep making the same album and stuff, and they do very well out of it, and, you know, best of luck to them. But I, I've never been one of those people. No. Um, <clears throat> especially, you know, I think, yeah, but it being, if you're getting paid big money and stuff, then I'm fine, man. But if, you know, <laughs> because it's such a, because it's been a struggle, yeah. um, you know, for a long time, it, it's, you have to make something that's gonna be, that you're going to enjoy. Otherwise, what is the point? You oh, know? Yeah, absolutely. And it's that thing I was talking to... Um, um, an artist called Zuzu, and she's been around for quite a while. She's yet to put out her debut album, and she's been signed to m many different labels and had loads of issues and been ripped off here, the wrong management, all kinds of stuff. But she's still driven, and she's on yeah. the verge of putting her first album together, like 10 years after she got her first record deal when she was 14. You know, wow. she's been through the ringer. It's that drive to keep doing it, isn't it? And it is. And I was saying to her, what is success to you? Because she hasn't had success yet. And she said, is to be able to put something out that brings enough back in so I can carry on. Yeah, yeah. And from, the, yeah, that's the thing. And it, I think it's both a blessing and a curse sometimes. Mm -hmm. It can be your undoing. Because a lot of people, I think it's the half the, half the time of music, certainly to make a, a, a long career out mm -hmm. of it, it's almost last man standing. Yeah. And there's so much shit that gets thrown at you. And gradually your skin either gets thicker or yeah, it breaks you. Yeah. And it's, and, but you can't, I think, again, had you known the amount of stuff you had to go through to get to this point, you'd never do it. No one would. But no. I think it, that, that, when you say, yeah, that kind of like that drive, that inner, that fire burning in your belly, I think as long as you have that, I think it's, you know, you just, just, you just keep going. Yeah. And as long as you're getting enough back, obviously, you know, if, if you get nothing back and you've got, you know, you've been doing it 15 years and you've, you, you know, you still haven't got a pot to piss in sort of thing and it's, and it's bad, you're putting yourself in financial, you know, shit. So I think obviously that's different. But, like you said, like like Zuzu said, as long as there's enough coming back for you to want to keep doing it and to enable you to do it, um, I think it's you know it's it's a blessing because music is a blessing and it's it can be it can be magical. Yeah. And I think I think that's what people forget now. Also, with the, the advent of social media, this is probably like a sideways rant, but I think that sometimes that magic can be taken away and it can be just seen as like a you know just celebrating success and the business side of it all the time. But actually, when you make when you make something that's you know, that kind of moves people and stuff. It's it's still a magical thing. And it's just, I think that's the reason we got to get into it to begin with. Yeah. And I think keep that and there, there's a little bit of magic there and a little, you know, you feel the hairs on the back of your neck stand up when you hit something. Yeah. Um, that's the reason we do it. And, you know, it's not all about money and not all about kind of, you know, the struggle. That's when it makes it all worthwhile. Yeah. So. Yeah, I mean, that is that is what you said there. That's the big payoff, isn't it? It's when you've done something and you go, oh, fuck me. Yeah, it's that sheer yeah. excitement, and it's also, which then you know, because what we do is an art form, you know, yeah. where we are creating, and this this is something Yolanda Charles, the the bass player, was talking to me about, is that her joy she gets when she's performing even other people's songs, yeah, them, in losing losing themselves in the moment, and it's just like, the, the, we're, what we are creating is an art form that brings pleasure to people. Exactly, and and that's the thing you shouldn't. That's the thing that you should never forget. I think mm. is you know, people. You get messages from people saying that you know your album helped me through a really difficult time, just recovering from cancer, or what. You know, we we came down the aisle to one of your songs, and it's yeah. just that. It's just you can't buy that. Can yeah. you? I mean, that magic. That. Yeah. Um, and certainly, when I started playing, you know, when I started producing music, I could never have envisaged stuff like that, and you don't. 
But then when that stuff happens, you think, shit, that's that's incredible. Yeah. You no, know, you wouldn't get that if you're an accountant, would you? You know, I've got nothing against it. <laughs> That's all. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a very special thing. And music has the power to do that. So we, we are in a privileged position where we can make that happen. Yeah, um, yeah that's why we do it. Yeah, it's, fun, it's funny you keep mentioning accountants because my accountant... <laughs> I've got nothing quite, against No, accountants. no, no, it's good. It's, it's my, 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 Shout my, out to my... <laughs> I mean, it's amazing. Um, my, my accountant yeah. comes to a lot of my gigs and he's like... Because he, he utterly loves music. And he's like, no one ever gives me screams and gives me a standing ovation when I've got my sums right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They're the most underappreciated, probably the most hardworking people. And all the musicians have to do is just, you know, rock up on stage, play a power chord, and everyone goes mental. You know, and yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I totally get that. But then, yeah, that is what makes what makes it magical, and that's why you get into it in the first place because you hear someone else do it, or you get that inspiration from someone else, and you think, shit, yeah, I want a bit of that. So yeah. then you that fires it, and I've never lost that, and I think that's why I'm still here. Yeah, absolutely, and. So do you have your own recording space, as in your own sort of like defined studio setup? Yeah, so um, I've kind of moved around studios a lot. I've, I've always had one, uh, most of the time I've had one in my house or mm. kind of, you know, um, in like outbuildings or whatever. Um, but it's kind of varied. Some, some of them have been kind of sort of fairly sort of comprehensive and, and can record drums and stuff. Sometimes I've, I've worked at little sort of workstations that, you know, just a laptop and a few bits. Um, more recently, I've, I've had a space in our basement, which I am now. Mm -hmm. But because um, we've had, and I've kind of made it so that I have a live room and a control room and stuff. Um, but then I've, to, to record I'm here now, I went to a studio in South Devon called Middle Farm. And I loved, I actually loved the fact that I had an engineer there and I just hopped on different instruments. Yeah. He, at the same time that I was kind of working out parts, he was then comping and editing and then we had the, you know, creating loops and then we had, you know, kept jumping on other instruments and just firing. It was just, it was glorious, man. Yeah. Kind of, you know, so I think that is going to be the way I probably go. Yeah. Um, I'll still go home because I have to come back and mix stuff, you know, oh, overdubbing yeah. keyboard parts and bass parts and stuff. But just to be able to go down and record drums and not have to, you know, swap out snare drums and, you know, different cymbals and different kind of mic techniques because he has a lovely live room. So, I mean, you know, to have that in your, in your, you know, um, house. Mm -hmm. A, a, you know, a space that has a lovely live room like that is, is, is amazing. So, um, yeah, I think probably in the, the way forward, I'll have a little studio at home and then go to other studios yeah. to record. Drums are the thing, man. Drums are the pain in the arse. Yeah. You can DI a bass, you can mic up a bass, you can, you know, guitars, keys, no problem, straight in. Drums are the, drums are the you know, the arse. Yeah. So, uh, you know, and they're, and they're such a key element of anything. So Absolutely. if you get a crap drum recording or if it's not right, then it's, you're just, you know, pissing it in the wind with the whole thing. So... Yeah, that's that's what's going to happen from now on. I think and it's also <clears throat> talking about going to Middle Farm. It's also the uh, the freedom where you can go. I can just concentrate on the drum part now. Yeah. Not yeah. How's it sounding? How's it sitting with no. the rest of the track? Yeah. It's like I can just enjoy playing it. And that, that's the thing that reignited because I'd made that decision to to play all the instruments and stuff. It was only because I knew about Middle Farm and I knew about Pete and and, and his gear down there and how you know what a great engineer he was that I felt comfortable doing it. Um, and that's you've hit the nail on the head. As when when you're trying to do it all yourself, you've obviously got so many different hats on that you know not one of them is is, is they're all over the place. So yeah. you're kind of you know, and then you're worried about one of the compressor channels that you know is broken. So you have to repatch it into something else, and that affects then. So oh, shit, I had that keys part in my head. Then what, what was <laughs> yeah, that? And then, it gone. <laughs> and then it's gone. And then your bass, you know, you haven't propped your bass up in the corner, and that falls over. And then you and it's ah oh, fuck it, <laughs> like ah oh, damn. So yeah. <laughs> having someone else to you know to do that and actually having the freedom to go down there and not worry about any of the gear yeah. it's all what um just hop on yeah hop on the instruments and just didn't figure out stuff yeah, yeah. it's amazing, really yeah. i would love, love that i'd love to, to get to a point where you know um on someone else's dime obviously yeah. you you go into these wonderful studios and, and use the gear and just and not worry about it i mean that that would be amazing i think that's why, that's why I'm still here. That's why I'm still doing it. <laughs> Perfect. But that again, that again, on someone else's dime, then that brings a pressure in, though, because they're, cause they're, wait, they're, they're like, it's better be fucking good. We, yeah. we better be able to get this on the radio and people better stream shitloads of this, you know. Again, that, there's pretty, yeah, absolutely, man. You, you know, I mean, mm. you've, you've been in that situation and, and the more a label invests in you, the bigger they, they want to see the return. And that, you know, bands, some bands can handle that pressure and they just keep, you know, shitting out the hits and other bands just crumble. And I yeah. think that's, 
when it's on someone else's dime, it's lovely because you're thinking, I don't have to front these studio costs. I can just think, think about the music. Then you finish the recording, it comes out, and it like you know it bombs, and you think, shit, shit. you know. <laughs> <laughs> we ain't going to see any royalties for the next 10 Ever. years. But yeah, that's, you know, it swings yeah. and roundabouts, but yeah. yeah. So can we talk about, and obviously, if you want to say no, that no is no, the whole thing coming up with my... I don't know, mate. I don't, I don't know whether, I don't know whether I can, I can talk about it or not. I don't... Well, um, what we can do, let's talk about it, but we'll bleep out the names. Okay, well, that's good. Okay, yeah, I like yeah. it. So you've been approached recently by an absolutely, you know, legendary record label. Got legendary studio. A cer certain bands named part of their second album after them. We'll just leave it there. <laughs> yeah. So, oh yeah, I forgot about that. Called, yeah. That's why it's called that. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we're not. We're not going to say the name of the the record label. Um. <clears throat> <laughs> but, you know, this is a really famous record label and it goes to the roots of the music you love anyway. Yeah. You know, a lot of the things that you've got, these, that have inspired you to make music in the first instance and right. continue to do so. So how did that come about? Um, completely out of the blue. Mm -hmm. um, it was one of those emails that you get, very similar to the one that you sent me on MySpace all mm -hmm. those years ago, mm -hmm. um, where you actually think it's just some guy pissing about, essentially, because there's no... Oftentimes, sometimes when the, when kind of you know the labels that you sort of respect or, or bigger labels come calling, they don't. There's no bluster, or it's just mm. a it's dude, isn't it? There's, you know, this this guy. It was on Facebook, mm -hmm. uh, but immediately I thought, well, you know, this is yeah, it's yeah. not going to. This this is nonsense. This guy's pissing about. Um, but yeah, he, he he emailed and said that he'd been following my stuff for a while, and and that it was you know he loved it, and you know would I consider going to um, uh, going to um, and record an album for, for and it was I think it took it took a good sort of two or three phone calls and like long phone calls like hour long phone calls mm. with this guy kind of suss him out and actually sort of you know and him suss me out and actually yeah. you, know, you know what it's like man 90% of the stuff you that comes through you know I've, I've, and that's the other thing that makes it such a hard business is, mm. is that character that gets dangled in front of you so many times you think oh this is going to happen this is it this yeah, is yeah. the one and then gets pulled away and you're like and that just little bit chips away at you. So you kind of, there was an element of me that thought, you know, this is, I'll phone him up and it'll be, it'll be nonsense. It'll be like, you know, you have to pay to come to us or yeah. something. We're, we're raising money for something or I don't know. Um, so yeah, so we kind of, we spoke many times and, and yeah, and then it came to it that they, they just like what I do and they were kind of very keen to sort of, you know, for me to go over there and, and record at, at that place and for them and, Use you know use some of the local guys there and some of the local vocalists and kind of make it you know make it a thing mm -hmm. make it make it an album and and like you said it those are the sort of things that you know when they come through obviously we're working at, at it now and, and see see what happens mm -hmm. but um, those are the sort of things that make it all worthwhile man and it's it's music can do that that's the other yeah. thing about the industry is that all of a sudden you you'd be kind of you know you'd be feeling down on your ass down on your luck you've had a shitty few months. No, you know, the royalties have kind of dried up, sales have dried up, whatever. Then you get an email out of the blue mm -hmm. saying, do you want to do this? And you're like, you know, <laughs> where's that come from? Like, where's it come from? And it's just that I think sometimes it's just the universe reminding you that you're on the right path, you know, even though you don't think you are. Mm -hmm. And you might be hammering on, on social media or for whatever reason, or someone might have just, you know, left a shit-ass comment on your page or, or, you know, read something about yourself or a bad review or something, and yeah. you think, shit, what, is, what am I doing? And then and you get an email from, you know, from someone. And it's just, it, yeah, it kind of, like, straightens you back up, like, yeah. you know, dust yourself off, and you think, right, let's go again. Let's go. And it's amazing because it's like, if you think of the heritage of that, yeah. and, and it's like, and then you get the call, which is, as you said, it straightens you up, but it's a huge validation yeah. of those seven records, the mixes you've done, all the things that you've gone through to get to when that email pops into your inbox. Yeah, it's um, it's crazy. And like you said, it's it's more it's the validation, and it's the kind of, even though you know, validation enough should be should obviously you know being able to make a living at this and this, the the whole thing that you know that brings and you know, but you do need validation. I think as musicians we do because you know we're constantly being judged for our work. We're con it's, it is such hard work. It's in a hard industry to even make a dent in. Yeah. Uh, anyway. So you do need the, the you, do, you need the occasional tummy rub. You need the occasional some person to say, you know, 
you, you, this, you're doing the right thing. This is great. Um, and that when stuff like that happens, it is. It's a validation. Yeah. And it, you know, man, like you said, for me, it's for the sort of music I'm into. It's it's kind of couldn't really get any better. Mark Ronson must have been busy or something, man. I think you know. <laughs> Or me, you know, it's like, oh, who's on that? No, he can't do it. It's just ah. <laughs> yeah, maybe you were twenty seventh on the list, and everyone else, tw- yes. the other twenty six, has said, "Fuck off." First person they thought of. I think I, I don't know, man. I think that's a bit of a lie. So, uh, <laughs> but no, man, look, it's, it's incredible. I, I'm, I can, you know, it's very exciting, and it's given me another lease of, you know, another lease of life because every, everything that you do. Like you said, seven albums in. Mm. But after every album, well, after after the last sort of you know three albums, I've, I'm convinced that's the last one uh-huh. because every album leaves me knackered yes. and broke, and thinking it's so much effort. And also because I put them out myself as mm. well. So then you write the album, you finish it. Whereas normal artists would just kind of like hand it over to the label, say right, I'm done, on to the next one, or let's go on a tour and let's yeah. get you know. Um, I don't. I yeah. I I then I'm talking to manufacturers. I'm talking to you know talking about the car, the type of card to put in the inlay and it's like you know it, it, it sucks up it sucks up mind space yeah I don't yeah. know why I'm doing that and I, I'm doing it for a reason but at the time it's you know you just finished a record and you're, you're emotionally spent and then yeah. you have to start thinking about right how are we going to market this now and how are we going to you know it's just like yeah it's a lot man it's a lot yeah. so to have something like that is um yeah it's it's it adds the excitement puts the fire back in you yeah. know Exactly, and it's also that thing, putting the fire back in for all the mundane shit you have to deal with. So, you know, promoting, you know, I'm here now. It's like the relentless having to social, social media update, this, that, that. And, you've got, exactly. and then you've had this, t- as you said, tummy rub validation of like, ah. Yeah. Now I know, it's like, I know why I was doing it, but I made the record, I'm exhausted, I've been dealing with manufacturers, I've got to do my updates, I've got to do the video, I've got to blah, blah, blah. And you think, yeah. oh, just fucking leave me alone. And then you get an email like that and you go, Okay. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And it's, that's the, and I think, you know, I, I carry on making music anyway because I'm, like I said, I'm, I've, that fire's never really left. Mm. But who doesn't want to receive an email like that? Like yeah. the validation is it's just so important because no one wants to, you know, as an artist, you want to, your music to be heard by as many people as possible. And I'm not ashamed in saying that. It's not yeah. because I'm, you know, want to sell out or anything. I've never wanted to be a niche, you mm. know, producer or anything. It's just so happened that, you know, it started off that way. Um, you know, my aspirations, you know, stretch way further than where I am now. And I think as long as I have that, I'll, I'll always want to kind of keep keep going because um, I've still got stuff I want to say. Yeah. When you get an email like that, you think, shit, man, I can say I can say stuff. And actually, you know, the doors of that will open, um, and the amount of people, more the amount of more people that will be able to hear my stuff, whether they like it or not, they can in front of people. Yeah. And that's that. And we're going back to what we were saying earlier about the industry. That's the battle now. Yeah. People are flooded with new music you know your new release radar on spotify is just every week just like so many no more albums than i can listen to yeah that's that's what you're up against yeah so if you, can, you know if something like this comes in um and you 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 know um are able to 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 sign with a, a label like that that has the reach and that has the then you know who wouldn't do that and who wouldn't exactly. enjoy doing exactly. it and for me it's just you know it'd be so it'd be so refreshing to be able to do it you yeah know? and also with that whole um the thing of like you know that 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 coming about, it then generates people going. Once they hear that, then they then they find out. Oh, you've done this and you've done this and this and so all those great records, the other great records, seven records you made. Then people go, oh my god. Yeah, and that you know, that is the side of it that sometimes you struggle with as an artist because obviously yeah. you you like to think that your records are good and they are good because mm. you know, you wouldn't. You take confidence from what you've done before. Yeah. So if you do a first album that actually takes some traction and gets, you know, you think, shit, okay, I'm onto something here. You do the second one. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, and but where people are concerned, sometimes you know they they, and and you know I'm not blaming people for this tour. It's just how it is. If if a person sees your your music come out on your own label, sometimes they think, oh, he's just self releasing because you know probably can't find a label blessing, mm-hmm. can he? You can't find a label that's, you know, <laughs> it's just, and you think, yeah, and then you can't be asked to kind of go into the whole, you know, why you're doing it and mm-hmm. stuff. Um, but then they see your music on, you know, on a label like that, and, and all of a sudden it changes, their perception of you changes. Um, and that's what a label can do. So labels are hugely still relevant because of that, yeah. because of the that they can open, and that, you know, that change in the consciousness of people looking at your music and listening to it. And it's also a validation for them as well, because I know a lot of people have listened to my stuff 
from day one. There's mm. people that still buy my yeah. now that have been from the very beginning. And it'll be a validation for them too, because I know a lot of them have been shouting out about my stuff to their friends and stuff and trying to spread the word. And then when this happens, they'll be like, I told you. See? Yeah, yeah. And that for the, and that would be amazing for them yeah. as well, you know, because yeah. I know a lot of people have been doing that. And so for me it would be incredible for but for also a lot of people that have been following me from the start, it'd be it'd be great for them too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's a, like you said, it is it is that validation, it's that kind of stamp of approval from a label that people will then think, Oh, he's on that, he's doing that. Well he must be I'll check him out then. Yeah, yeah, Where, exactly. Checked you out before, they might say, Oh yeah, I'll, I'll do it later. Now yeah. if he's on there, I'll check you out. Yeah. You know, and that and then it just begets itself, doesn't it? So Yeah, absolutely. And then the other thing which I only li- I listened to this morning which obviously when this comes out, it won't be this morning, it'll be two weeks ago. But it's <laughs> fucking amazing, that soundtrack you sent me. Uh, yeah, the OST yeah. for this film, can we mention it? Yeah, we can. Well, I can, I mean, I can, I can basically say, say what it is because mm. it's, not, not an actual, it's not a film at all. Oh, right, okay. It's not a film at all. So essentially, um, my, uh, we, way before the Lack of Afro stuff came mm. out, I'm, I, was a, I wanted to be a film composer, mm-hmm. essentially. That's what I wanted to do. So my heroes were guys like, you know, John Williams, Thomas Newman, John Barry, those guys. And to a certain extent, they are still my heroes. Mm. But then got, I got into the, like, I got into kind of making tracks of my, my own. Because back, you know, back then, I mean, there's loads of courses on how to, you know, write music for film and yeah. stuff. But back when I started, it was this very much seen as this kind of like, you know, that's way off. Do you know what I mean, those guys are just, yeah. um, so I kind of, you know, the Lack of Afro stuff came along and I rolled with it for a long time. Um, and it kind of, you know, I sort of all this, the film composer stuff fell by the wayside. But throughout it all, I've kind of, you know, sort of maintained this goal to, you know, to, 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 to do more scoring work. And I did, I've done a few bits. I did, you know, a few bits for ABC a few years ago and like a few kind of networks and stuff like that. But never, I never kind of sunk my teeth into a whole score. Mm. So I thought, I, I took a leaf out of um, David Holmes's book, mm. actually. He's one of my favourite composers, actually. Contemporary composers, yeah. obviously, but killer, killer guy. Um, and for his first, one of his first records, he basically made up a soundtrack, made up a film and then soundtracked it. Mm. So I've done the thing. Wicked. And it doesn't exist. It's not mm. a film that exists, but the soundtrack does. Uh, and I've, I've soundtracked a film that it doesn't exist, essentially. So, Wicked. yeah, that's what it is. So uh, with a view to kind of, you know, having people listen to it and think, yeah, maybe I'll hit them up to mm. soundtrack. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And But things it looks like one as well, because you, you'd set, set like what would be like the, the film poster or whatever. Yeah. We've done a poster and everything. We've done a proper poster. We've done like we've even done. Um, we've cut a trailer using a lot of old kind of you know footage and, and all that sort of stuff. So you know, as promo, because we got to you know you got to promote it and all that sort of yeah. stuff. Uh, and you know, we, we made the decision to sort of release it properly because once it's on, if you give it a proper release, people kind of take it more seriously yeah. rather than just sending it around to supervisors and all that sort of stuff. Um, I think you know because the music's great anyway, yeah. and I kind of I wanted people to hear it and all that sort of stuff. And and yeah, I think you know. That's what it's designed to do, whether it, whether that will work or not. Um, but also, I guess sometimes, you know, I think you, you'll have probably found this as well. Obviously, you get, you know, people think of you as doing one genre yeah. of music. You get kind of, you know, people say, oh, he, just, he does that. Yeah. And you, and, but you don't. I mean, you, you know, I know for a fact, you're, you're a huge jazz fan, yeah. for example. Um, and, you know, as am I. And it's like, you know, I want to do some jazz albums. Mm. You know, I want to do certain different types of albums. And I guess the soundtrack stuff would enable me to to get that out, you know, yeah. to get that kind of creative, you scratch that creative itch, you know. Um, so there is an element of that about it too. Yeah. Um, and, you know, so yeah, fingers crossed. I'm waiting for, um, you know, Tarantino's on standby, I think, to give me a <laughs> shout. So I'm, I'm available. You, I, I know you know him, so you can give him a shout. Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll give you his number. Yeah, thanks, mate. Yeah. But yeah, what's re- what, I mean, what's great about the soundtrack thing is, even though it's, you think, oh, the, it's, it's really huge and it's really long, there's actually, you can rework the same ideas. You've got your motifs and you can bring them in and you can bring them out. And you can also, also produce the motifs to create a different track. Because it's like, I don't know, it was like 18 tracks or something you sent me? Or tra- yeah, actually, it might even be over 20, 21 yeah, or 20, something. 20, yeah. 20, it's like, yeah. And it's like, I was lit, so I, I listened to it backwards. Just, oh, just, just the way I opened it. So I listened to everyone backwards and I was like, oh, this sounds awesome, the next one. And then like four tracks later, you go, ah. <laughs> that was that riff, yeah. and then, but that's what's lovely about it, isn't it? It's like, you know, you don't have to write 24 songs. No, and that, that do you know what, I love soundtracks for that, mm. and that, that's exactly it, when you, 
um, the John Barry soundtracks were killer for that. Actually, you kind of as you as you go through them and listen to them. Obviously, they, you know, a lot of characters have their own themes, and then you have a main theme, and like a you know, there's always an intimate theme. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, when <laughs> when 007's on special maneuvers, obviously there's a there's a there's a trap for that. But you always you hear little kind of um, little motifs come back mm-hmm. again. But like you said, they re, you know recontextualize under a different you know different you know harmonic thing or using different instruments and it's just it's just lovely to have it. but yeah. you can't get away with that on a regular artist album <laughs> no because it, it sounds the same as the other song <laughs> like, he's just you know what's he doing that's a lazy bastard um so yeah but i think that's the beauty of soundtracks is that they kind of take you on a little journey yeah um once you just when, when you think you know it and you think you've got it sussed all of a sudden it you know changes on you and it's just you know puts things in a different context yeah. and that's Beauty of them, yeah. Yeah. I mean, what, what I loved about it, obviously it sounds awesome as well, but I know you for your production and, you know, the guitar, drums, bass, all the sampling, everything. But the yeah. string parts you put on there. The strings? Yeah, so good. Thanks, man. I, well, you know, I've got to give a shout-out to Rory, Rory Simmons. Mm. He's a um, um, good friend of mine who lives in uh, um, lives in London, and he mm. does a lot of string arrangements. And he works with three three guys, um, uh, Kit, Natalie, and Paloma, mm. so they, tracks them up in his in his studio um and yeah he just gets this amazing so i've worked with him for a few years and he's just he, uh, the thing is he knows what i like yeah. and i know that he can he can do the stuff yeah. so he just he just gets on with it man and it's occasionally he'll send me something i'll be like oh, can you change this and mm. about but you know we, we work well together and he's you know it's just it's just awesome and it, also recording strings is you know a, a pain and it's an art yeah. form yeah, it's also. a total art form yeah you can go down the whole sampled strings through, and obviously there's some amazing sampled string packs you can get, you know, those um, like Spitfire Audio and all those yeah. guys that do, you know. But I, I don't know, there's something nice about being able to do it, even though it's, you know, it's not the biggest string sound in the world, but it's, it's a unique string mm-hmm. sound because that's how Rory does it in his studio with the three guys and tracking them up and tracking them up, and you won't find that in a sample library. So yeah. if you can do it, I think it's, you know, well worth it. But I think a lot of people get put off by recording strings because it is an arse sake yeah. and it is you know it can be expensive the more string players you have but you know it's they add so much especially with you know sort of soundtrack that stuff dot, yeah it, it gives it that classic edge yeah instantly away. gives you something doesn't it it sets yeah. you there sets the scene straight yeah. away right I'm, I'm here that's great Brilliant. lovely well, and now I've got to um, speak, ask you about Watsky as well, because obviously out of all the collaborators you've had, and obviously, yeah. I mean, hip-hop's one of my big loves as well, so you've had Herbal and Wax as well, but obviously Watsky, particularly recently with his Guinness Book world record-breaking, um, relentless 30, 30, point, 30 hours and 20-minute rap. That's so just did, nuts. No. Yeah, how did you come about working with him then? It was through, um, through Wax and through Camilla. So mm. Camilla... Is on is on the record, um, and she was on my last record as well, um, on a track called Only You and Me. She's she sings backing vocals for him when he tours right. the states, and I, I I heard his stuff you know a few good few years ago because he him and sort of Wax and Herbal Tea and those guys were sort of part of the same you know so I, I, they probably weren't part of the same crew necessarily, mm-hmm. but I always listened to those guys, um, and they're always kind of bigging each other up on social yeah. media and giving house and stuff and it was they were kind of part of the same thing um you had kind of watsky had wax herbal tea like dumbfounded as a guy mm-hmm. called dumbfounded and actually you had a guy called breezy lovejoy mm-hmm. who was anderson pack funny story about anderson pack i had a chance to work with him a while ago not when he was anderson pack when he was when he was breezy lovejoy his manager contacted me again because he heard my stuff through wax and stuff and mm-hmm. he liked my kind of vibe so before it kind of you know um before it all happened and i for whatever, I think I just finished an album. I was knackered, wasn't really feeling it. I was like, "Oh man, I'll get you some stuff soon," um, and didn't. Oh. And then ne- the next thing I hear, he's changed his name to Anderson Pack. He's um, been, you know, signed by Dr. Dre, and he's everywhere. Oh, and you know, can I get hold of him now? No, no, not. no. He's got big up to fry now, so you know, I missed out on a chance to work with Anderson Pack, which you know, there you go. Yeah, always, well. always follow stuff through. You never know where it's going. Yeah, to be. yeah, no, yeah. Well, always. I mean. I've got a um, similar, probably even more heartbreaking than that is um, a producer mate of mine was asked to do um, a record called Nevermind. <laughs> but he turned uh, it down. <laughs> I, I bet nothing happened with that, did it? Didn't, didn't it? <laughs> he turned it down. <laughs> Doesn't sound like a good title for a record. No, it was, never, it was never going to work. And the reason why he turned it down, because he'd spent three months work producing another band's re- record. He'd been out in LA for three months. He's like... I just want to go home. I'm knackered. Yeah, uh, do you know what? That's that's fair enough. You can't you can't foresee stuff no. either. You're not a fortune teller, man. We haven't no. got a crystal ball, no. and you just got to do what you feel. And if you're knackered from a you know, and 
that's the thing. You how rare are hit records like that? Yeah. I mean, they don't long very often, yeah, yeah. Uh, and the chances of you, you know, if you're knackered, if you're missing your family, if you, you know, what, for whatever reason, and you get a chance to do a record that you know, it's just another record at that yeah. time, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So that's the thing. Also, I think the longer, the more you're in, the longer you're in the industry for, I think the better decisions you make as yes, well. Absolutely. You learn. I mean, I'll never make that mistake again, no. for example. You know, um, and I knew he, and I could hear it. I could hear he was. You know, he was, there was something, you know, not more than something there. I mean, you know, these damn, it's amazing. Yeah. It's, but yeah, you just, you know, for whatever reason you don't, and it's, you know, that's that's the thing. Yeah. But, you know, um, I'm still waiting for the call to produce his next record, but, you know, I think <laughs> you never, Well, after, but you never know. You never know, actually, yeah. yeah. Giving him a call for that, but, yeah, who knows? Yeah. yeah. But, yeah okay, yeah. so my last question, which is people, some people love this. Some people I've been chatting to, they're like, oh, come on. I want you to pick, and we're going to put links to all of them as well, three things that you've done that's not, they're not going to represent you as an artist because that's impossible because it's like every, everything you've done represents you as an artist. But three things that you do for whatever reason would stand out for you. For it could be the first thing you made, this is really special because, or whatever. Just like yeah. three, three tracks could be <clears throat> three whole records. It's up to you. Okay. Um, man, that's like... Right on the spot, isn't it? Yeah. Like saying, what's your favourite song? No pressure. Um, I think I'd probably I'd have to say, you know, press on as a whole mm. record. Mm. But I think from that album, I think maybe <clears throat> I think maybe maybe a track called um, "Touch My Soul," which was mm -hmm. the, the one that sampled Steve Marriott and the, and the Small Faces sample in it, simply because that opened my stuff out to a whole kind of audience of the, the, the Northern Soul guys and the Mod guys. Mm -hmm. And some of which have never never left me, sort of thing. They, they still buy my stuff now, and I'm still in contact with a lot of them. So I'd probably say that from that record. Plus, I was a huge Small Faces fan, and we actually did clear the sample properly, um, which took a long time. Um, so yeah, I'd probably say that one from that record. Um, what other ones have we got? Moving through. God, man, this is this is hard work. I know. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not really sorry. Um, there's um, oh, there's a track from um, Jack of All Trades called Back to the Day. And that's one tracks where um, I had a vibe in my head. I wanted to do something like Jackson 5 uh Jackson 5, like Wolfpacky, that kind of stuff. And I think I'm pr we pretty much, we nailed it with that one. I think that's, there's one of those, you know those tracks sometimes where you have, you hate, you hear it. Yeah. And a lot of the time, you never, you don't quite, it, turn, it always turns out into something, something different, else. different, yeah. As nice as that is, it's kind of, you know, it just does its own thing. But that one I had in my head. I wanted to do that, and it kind of and it came out, and it was it was there, and it was done. Mm. I, look, I listened to that now, and think, yeah, we nailed that. That's really nice. So I'll probably say that one, um, and then probably on the recent one, a track, um, put a track called "Wait for Me," which mm. is the, the one with Mika Miller, mm. um, and I think that simply because um, it's just a it's a it's an old school kind of well, it's not old school. It's just a, it's a, just a, a classic kind of song, and that, that I wrote on the piano actually. Mm. I wrote all of all of Wicked. that on the piano, and it's the, probably the one song that I've done that too uh, with. And it's you know that's from kind of start to finish, um, and it's probably the it might be the only one I ever do. You mm. know, it's just one of those kind of ones that just happened. It happened really quickly, and then Mika added her vocal later on, and I think just the whole thing and just the, you know, how easy it was to record at, at, at Pizza Middle Farm. And I remember jumping on and jumping off different instruments and just kind of it all very nat flow very naturally. Yeah. So I'd probably say that one. But then I've, I've got in my head the, the Wax and Double Tea tracks, and there's just too many, man. It's I know, just I'm sorry. <laughs> that's that Back in Business EP that I did with Wax and Double Tea. That oh, like yeah. Back in, take it up a notch. That EP as a whole, I think. All right, you check. can have four. We'll throw that one on as well. You Thank can have you. four. Nice. You see, I was, I was talking to Jeff Dugmore, who's, uh, he's like, he's played on 50 number one albums, and I said, he was like, you can't just say three. I said, no, three, go. And he was like, oh, for fuck's sake. <laughs> and then he started to go, and can I have another one? I just said, no, so you're the only one who's been allowed for. Oh, mate, I, I'm, I, I, feel, I feel that. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now I'm going to ask you a nerdy question because we, you get quite a lot of, um, en, you know, budding engineers and stuff, producers. What if you, is the one piece of tech that you can't do without when you're, when you're producing something? Is it, it could be a mic or a, a particular compressor or just... Piece of hardware, not a plug-in. Hardware. Yeah, hardware. God, I'm just I'm trying to th think, man. Um, that's a really hard one, mm -hmm. simply because I've, I've I've gone through so many setups mm -hmm. over the years. Um, I think probably a, a 
God, that's no, really, that's really hard. I was going to say a decent mic preamp. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, the preamp makes up such a lot, of, such a lot of the sound. Um, but it, I mean, it depends what you're doing, doesn't it? Yeah. it? Depends what sort of genre of music it is. Um, I'm trying to think of the one thing that I use more than anything else. Um, hang on a minute. I'll look in my. I'll look in. The, I'll look in the room. <laughs> one sec. Do you know what, man? Probably, probably monitors. I would say. Right. Okay. No, I, you know, as boring as that is, I think it's, it's you know, and it doesn't. Well, I should say that it doesn't matter how good or bad they are. Mm. It just matters that you know them well. Yeah. You totally. Know? And it just, you know, it's, and if you know something's going to sound good on them, then that's kind of half the battle. I know, I know guys who monitor with you know, ten grand speakers, and I know guys who monitor with you know, two hundred quid hi-fi speakers that yeah. they've had for about twenty years. It doesn't really matter as long as you know them inside out and how yeah. much you know, low end and treble to add or cut or whatever. I think, you know, boring as it is, I'll probably say monitors. Yeah. I mean, I, I would agree as well. I mean, I've still got the... I'm, I'm, I'm using them now, actually, to, for your audio, the, the, the NS10s that we uh, sort of oh, en- en- engineered really? Mosley Shoals on. Still got them. Really? Right. Yeah. Because exactly, right. I obviously know them inside out. I know exactly what sounds they're, good on them. They're the good example, man, aren't they? If you can, again, if you can make them sound good on NS10s. Yes. I a pair of NS10s once, and I just couldn't get on with them. Yeah. I couldn't. Them. They were just so kind of like, you know, so harsh. But I know so many people who swear by them. And yeah. it's like, whatever, it doesn't matter, does it? No, whatever, no. whatever works. Yeah. Um, yeah. What's the most exciting question, uh, answer you've had for the for the tech thing? Did someone say, like, oh, Fairchild, my Fairchild compressor or something like ridiculous? Um, well, one of the one of the drummers I was talking to, um, he said, uh, yeah, I've got the bass drum that um, was used by the Stooges drummer on the first two Stooges albums. <laughs> it's like 20, 24 inch um, Gretsch, something or other. And he's like, yeah, yeah. that's my piece of kit. He said, I'll never use it live. I only ever use it in the studio. And everyone goes, how'd you get that bass drum sound? I said, you have to ask the, the guy from the Stooges because he gave no. it to me. Um, and then I had a guy called Dave Erringer who's got these Roger Mayer yeah, yeah, yeah. Says, Weird, yeah. I was looking at one yesterday, the, the new limiter he's got with the, the, the tape sim on it. That's yeah, it. Yeah. I, think he's, I think he's got like something to do with that. And he said, it makes everything sound all right. <laughs> yeah, all right. <laughs> yeah, and I didn't mean all right as in, you know, OK, but he makes, you know, even yeah. if you're struggling on a session, I can't get this sound. He said, I put that on and the world is a fine place. <laughs> well, there you go. Amazing. What <laughs> would yours be? Oh, it would, it would be my original jazz. I was one. going to say if you could take one bass, but it's oh, that, that one. That one, yeah. I mean, I've got, you know, quite a, such a ridiculous collection. I've even, I've even oh. added this one. If, if you can see it, we used, used to be in Queens of the Stone Age. This oh, nice, Paul bass yeah, there. Yeah. But it would be my '73 jazz. That one. Yeah. Have you still got that, that harmony that Ronnie Lane has? Oh yeah. Can you yeah. see? Oh, it is, there? is that it? Yeah, Background. it's over there. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Yeah. And, and next to it is an acoustic bass that um, was used by uh, the Bunnymen bass player for all the demos for Ocean Rain. Amazing. I just got, see, I just seem to collect other people's basses. <laughs> Have you got, like, a, does your missus allow one-in, one-out policy? No, or she's is just, it, no, no. no it's just, just buy them. In fact, I just bought a, um, a white P bass because she liked the look of it. Really? Yeah. Oh, you get her involved in the process. That's, that's easier. That's, that's easier. much better because then she takes ownership of it as opposed to disapproving. Oh, that's the key, isn't it? I, mean, I, I did. I asked my actually asked my wife about guitar colours. She said, "Oh, well, that one's nice." Yeah. So don't get so much of a bollocking when you when you buy it. You know, <laughs> key to it all. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, listen, I, this has been awesome. Thank you so much. Been great, man. Great to chat to you. Late, and now, so we're giving the big virtual round of applause. Adam H. Gibbons.